Eva Horn, Assistant Director of Kansas Prairie Biological Station. Hello. Hi. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit. We're going to go on a whirlwind tour of, of just skimming the top of what goes on here at Kansa and, and over the last 40 plus years that Kansa has been around. Um, and you, you see this little snake on here because I actually study animal behavior and I study reptiles and amphibians. So I, ha I like snakes and I have snakes in there. So, so you just have to, you know, overlook that. <laughs> you, want so, like, you want the lights off? Yes, please. Hopefully nobody will listen. Also feel free to like stick your hand up or yell or something if you have a question. I'm always happy to stop and answer questions. So be aware that that will make the talk go longer. So <laughs> depends on how long you want me to talk. Um, so starting out, the range of tall grass prairie, as you probably all know, the Great Plains goes all the way out into Colorado and up through here, but the tall grass prairie, prairie was the eastern part. And it covered quite a bit of, of the land. And it's got very deep soil, it's very rich, it's rich, really good farmland, and so now it has been, well, most of it has been transferred into farmland. And so this is uh, kind of an old map of the remnant prairies and the, the tall grass. And there's probably lots of little tiny dots, you know, where there's an acre here and an acre there that, of prairie that's remaining, but there's very little of that left, right? And so we started out with all of the prairies, tall grass, short grass, mixed grass, and everything, somewhere around 170 million acres. Um, and now less than 4% of that tall grass prairie that I showed you just in, in the other map, I don't know how much of the, do you know how much of the short grass and mixed grass is there? Not a clue. Okay. So, so for tall grass, it's less than 4%, and I actually saw an <laughs> estimate the other day that it was less than 1% now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the largest continuous remaining area of that is right here in the Flint Hills. So that's this outline, red outline there. Uh, so the Flint Hills of Kansas and Oklahoma is the largest continuous track that's left. Um, this is a satellite image from March 29th. All these little red dots in here, if you can see them, those are fires, all on that one day. Um, and in fact, we were burning that day too, so if you could look closely at this, there's some little red dots right in there. Um, yeah, yeah, you can see the smoke flumes on this too. Um, so last year was, was interesting weather-wise, and you'll learn that we burned based on the good weather. And there were really bad days and bad days and bad days and bad days, and we finally got a good day and everybody in the Flint Hills burned. And it caused all kinds of smoke issues if you've been listening to any of these. Uh, so, so that's one of the sort of conservation versus human uh, safety or, or health kind of controversy that goes on around here that you'll probably hear a lot more about. So what saved the Flint Hills? The soil is rich, it's, it's just as good farmland, or it could be just as good farmland, but there's one thing about the Flint Hills that you don't find in the other farmland. Anybody know what it is? Rocks. Rocks. All these little white dots here in the foreground, all along these ledges, those are all rocks. Um, and if you've tried walking out here, you've stepped on some of those and tripped over them and that kind of thing. Also, these rock ledges, you know, they make these little plateaus uh, that would be nice and flat for the, it's not as steep. But the rock ledges are so close to the surface, there are places out there where the soil is only a few inches deep. And then you hit bedrock, and so you can't plow that. So, so that has saved the Flint Hills, and it turns out that a lot of the things about the Flint Hills, the grasses and, and things like that, are really good for cattle production. So we substituted what was the bison grazing. We now have cattle grazing. We burn the prairies to promote the cattle growth. That's all good for the prairie. So the Flint Hills, there are some problems, there are some conservation issues, and you'll probably learn more about those. Um, but overall, the plant community is pretty much what it was before European settlers came through. So back in the, in the 60s, the late 60s and early 70s, um, the scientists that were here, they knew that there were three major factors that interact to, to sort of create and maintain prairies. And this is sort of true for all grasslands over the entire world. Um, so, so who knows what they are? 
Rain. Rain. So climate is one. Fire. Fire. Fire is another one. What's the other one? The last one. Wind. Not wind. Wind's part of climate. But that's good. Grazing. Grazing. Yes. So these are the three main factors. We know these have something to do with maintaining prairies, pretty much grasslands everywhere. But they didn't really know how they interacted and how this whole thing worked. So in 1971, Lloyd Calder, um wanted to set up a research experimental station that would look at those three main factors uh, and try to figure out how they interact and look at it long term. So not just a little snapshot of it, but a long term uh, sort of research cycle. So we started out uh, in 1971 with just a thousand acres down here on the south side in Deering County. Um, and then by 79, they had added this larger point part up at the, on the north. Um, and the Nature Conservancy owns the biggest portion. Uh, the University Foundation, actually not in the State University itself, but the Foundation owns the thousand acres down on the south. And then we lease that to do the research uh, out here and the Division of Biology is who sort of manages the whole site. So, even back then, um, they, they split the area up into watersheds. Who knows what a watershed is? What's a watershed? It's pretty much a designated area that the water wants to come to a point. At which, so like a river, at one point in the river, everything upstream, if you draw an imaginary line along the ridges, you come to a uh, watershed, which will, all that water will go to that one point. In exactly. The Exactly. So all the water that falls on one of these areas drains down into the stays in that area. So if you're studying, you know, water flow or you're studying nutrient flow or something like that, that's a, that's very important. And so one of the things you'll notice when you go out and you, you tour around cons of the bison fence runs around the tops of the hills. And it's very convoluted. And that's because it's following these watershed boundaries around the tops of the hills. So they split Kanza up back in the beginning into some, somewhere around 60 different watersheds. I think we're just a little over 50 right now because we've adjusted them a little bit. Um, and split those watersheds up into different treatments. So this is a giant experiment. Um, and part of the treatment is to have different burn intervals. So all of these watersheds are burned every year. These are burned every two years, every three years, four years and 20 or unburned watersheds. We also have uh, what we call the seasonal watersheds. And for the most part, historically, yes? Uh, just real fast, about the burn intervals. So is that, if there is a natural fire, do you count that or do you not count that towards the burn? When, when we have a lightning strike or something, a wildfire of some sort, we will try to put it out if we can. If we can't, we'll go ahead and burn that watershed uh, to stop the fire from spreading. And then we'll reset, you know, whatever time, period. time it is. So if it's a four year and it got burned in its second year, we'll wait another four years to burn it again. Okay. Um, and, and we do get occasional wildfires. So, so all, almost all of our burning is done in the spring. So all of these different intervals are done in the spring. And that is historically when, you know, you would have had a lightning strike for the most part because most of the storms here occur in the spring during the growing season or in the early growing season. But you can have fires at other times of the year because we get fall storms, we get summer storms, you know, you get droughts that let fires travel in the summer. So we also have these seasonal burns down on the south side. And these two that are annual spring, as I mentioned, all these others are also spring, but these two are sort of designated as the controls for the, the other um, seasonal burns. So we have seasonal fall, also annual, uh, and winter, also annual. And those have already, or the, the winter has been done this year already, so if you're out on your tour, you'll see those watersheds. And then we have summer. Uh, we do not do them annually because if you have good growth in one year, you won't have anything to burn that year. So 
Uh, we do those every other year when there's actually some dead material in there. We, well, the first time we did this, we tried to burn it every year. And you go out and light the fire, and it would just die. So we have to wait until there's some dead material in there to be able to burn the, the summer. On top of this burn treatments, we have grazing treatments. So this area, the big area in the middle, is grazed by bison. The area over on, to, on the east side is grazed by cattle. And this is part of a new research project that we're doing called Patch Burn Graze Study, and you'll probably learn a lot more about that at some point. Um, but looking at a new type kind of management practice for, for burning in the Flint Hills. And then all those others without the hatch marks are ungrazed. Um, the gray ones that I didn't mark out, we sort of burn on a random schedule as we have time and, and we have the resources to burn those. So we can't, <coughs> the, the experimental design included grazing and uh, fire, but we can't really do watershed level climate experiments right now with the technology we have. So for that, we monitor climate. We have our own weather station out here. There are little rain gauges. They look like big milk jugs all over Kanza. You'll see those when you go around. We have rain gauges all over Kanza. We have uh, temperature sensors, there, there's all sorts of, of weather things. So we, we monitor those. And then there are small plot studies looking at um, actual manipulation of the climate. And as, as Joe mentioned, then you'll see more about those later on. But the characteristic of grassland climate is that it's very variable. And if you've lived in Kansas, if you have lived here for a long time, you know this. Um, if you just now come to Kansas, you will learn this. <laughs> But, but the climate here is extremely variable. You never know what it's going to do, right? Uh, and so just to give you sort of an example of this, this is Manhattan data. Our record high for today was in 2006 at 73 degrees. Actually, it might make, well, no, I don't think it's uh, The record low was in 2008, it was 10. The average high and low, 53 and 27, what was predicted as of yesterday when I looked, looked it up was 61 and 32. I don't know what the prediction is right now because it got more than that yesterday. Um, and then if you look at the highest ever temperature recorded was 116 in August of 1936, which was the Dust Bowl. The lowest ever for Manhattan was negative 31 in 1947 uh, in January. So very variable. And then if you look at this sort of plotted over time, so this is the average annual temperature for each year from 1895 to 2014. The average is 53. And you can see it's up, down, up, down, up, down, all the way across through there. So Kansas doesn't really have average temperatures, right? And rainfall is the same. This is the average. Annual rainfall in inches, our average is 33.7 all over the map. With these three really big peaks here, we've got some really dry years. So all over the place. And if you've heard about the Palmer Drought Index, um, this is where it doesn't just look at the amount of rainfall, but they take the temperature, they take the rainfall, they've got some big mathematical formula to calculate all this. And, and, and it also factors in water use by plants. Um, and it's sort of an estimate of dryness. Okay? And so this is for Northeast Kansas from 1895 to 2014. Um, and so the ones down below this line are considered drought years. The ones above are considered wet years. Um, this is the dust bowl here. and another big drought in 1956. Uh, we may be starting on one of these long-term droughts now because we've been down for three years in a row. This year is probably going to be down as well. Um, and one of the really interesting things I found, this is, I think, our largest rainfall, average rainfall for northeast Kansas was in 1951, 53 inches of rain. And just like four or five years later, we had the least 21 inches of rain. So you can have these extreme rain events and extreme dry events very close together within just a few years of each other. So, so it's pretty interesting. Also, this is the highest average temperature for a year ever recorded in northeastern Kansas, which was in 2012. 
Um, that was 57. So if you were here in 2012 and you remember how hot it was, <laughs> that's the highest average. Okay, so, so then what happens with fire? So historically, prairie fires, they were started by lightning strikes. The Native Americans burned because it attracted bison to an area. Um, and personally, if I were a nomadic tribe camping on the prairie, I would want to burn around where I was going to be camping because you do not want to be caught in the grass fire. Not good. Um, and now, many of the ranchers burn their land to promote growth, grass growth for their cattle. And you're probably going to see more about this uh, in a couple of weeks, but just to give you kind of a rough idea of how we, quick idea of how we burn on Kanza, we use what's called the ring method. So we always burn at 5 to 15 miles per hour wind speeds or less, which is potentially one of the reasons we're getting more, or at least contributing to more spread of woody vegetation because we don't burn, you know, if there's a storm, 30, 40 mile an hour winds carrying fires, you'd have much more intense fires. Nowadays we burn, because of safety reasons, 15 mile an hour or less. So we don't get as an as intense fire. And we always start out on the side of the watershed away from the wind direction. So if the wind's blowing this way, we start over in this corner. Um, and then we have two units. And they split up, they go around the watershed in different sides, and they end up meeting over in the middle. And we start out with what's called a backfire. And every one of those lines on that map around the various watersheds is actually a mowed fire garden. So the guys that work here have to go out in the fall and mow all of those strips around all those watersheds. Um, and that lets us light what we call the backfire off a mode area so it's easier to put out. So the, the vehicles come along behind and they put out what the wind is blowing into the fire guard and then the fire burns in. And this is this is the backfire, sort of creeping in to the vegetation. This is a summer burn, so there's more green in there. Um, this is more of a, a spring burn. And then as we go around the watershed, and, and you see that this is uh, one of our fall burns. We started up on this hill here and you can see that widened black area going around the edge as we go around these watersheds. Okay. And then close it up at the end, you get these really large intense fires being pushed by the wind, go across these watersheds, and we can have, sometimes it'll take us two hours to go all the way around a 500 acre watershed and it'll burn in 10 minutes or less once you light the head fire. It clo and it closes in on it. This is, a, again, a summer burn, so I was actually able to, summer burns burn a lot slower. So I was able to get a picture. Usually by the time you get this far away from a watershed, it's out. So we explain why you got that big mass of white smoke? From all the water in the, in the grass <laughs> vaporizing out of it. So a lot of that steam, we actually, sometimes we create little clouds when we burn. The water goes up and you get a little cloud forming up from the, from the smoke. And this is closing off a watershed, just again to give you a, sort of a, a picture of backfire versus head fire. Um, here's little people. So you can see how big those flames are going across. I mean, these are huge, hot fires. You, if, you go, if you watch a movie where people are standing next to fires in t-shirts or next to volcanic lava flows in t-shirts, you can't do that. This would blister you to stand next to. These guys are all in protective gear and usually the minute they meet there in the middle we've had one group coming around this way and one coming this way once they meet in the middle they're back over here away from the fire even with protective gear it's too hot um, so very very hot fires I've, I've actually seen one of the guys come out of some flames with a mask he had a mask on and the mask was melted so <laughs> so you really have to be careful on these fires what happens to the critters um, if they can get underground, they're fine. The, the heat is only above ground. Um, most of the time when we burn, there aren't very many animals active, so you don't catch very many of them because we burn early enough in the year not to get them. Uh, larger animals like deer and things like that, they will go down into the valleys in the middle where there are at least trees or the fire will slow down in those areas. Uh, and I've seen deer run into brush in the middle of one of these watersheds or down in the stream beds 
and then run back out again after the fire's gone by. So what about the reptiles and amphibians? Most of the reptiles and amphibians, when we burn, are underground. Or if they can get underground, they're fine, or under rocks. Uh, sometimes we catch turtles. But if it's a backfire, the turtles are fine, because they'll just pull back in their shell, and the, and the backfire is, is, is small enough and, and, le and low intense enough that, that they're okay. We do every now and then, we'll, we will catch a, a snake out sunning on a cool morning and it's not warmed up enough to get somewhere fast enough, so sometimes we do catch those. But the swains and hawks, we've never actually managed to get a good count of that sort of thing because the swains and hawks will come in and hover over the fire and they will pick off anything that, that runs out or um, gets caught in the fire. So, so it's really hard to get a good estimate of that kind. So that's unique to Swainson's hawk? I think so. I it's think that is, yeah. Pretty it's, pretty it's almost all uh. Swainson's hawks come in and, and do that. So it's really, it's really cool when we've got a fire going in the Swainson's. They'll come and like form flocks over, over the fires. Um, this is what it looks like right after a fire. And, and you know, people have seen this and they're like, oh, it's, it's dead. It's never going to grow again. It's gone, right? I mean, it looks like a lava flow. And I mean, this is my snake eye view of, of what it looks like in a burned area. So there's no cover there. If you're, if you're a small mammal or something, you come out of your burrow, there's nowhere to hide, right? But some animals prefer this kind of habitat and others don't. So you get animals actually moving around from burned to unburned. But within, you know, we get a little bit of rain, we get some sun. Within a few weeks, the grass starts to come up again. Um, and it all turns a brilliant emerald green. And then this is the snake eye view. So, so again, not much cover for small mammals in there if you're, if you're an animal that likes to be undercover. But if you're an animal that likes to eat grass, okay, that's easy to eat compared to this. This is an unburned watershed about the same level. So there's all this dead stuff in here. So, so if you're a grazer and you want to just pick the grass out of that, that's really hard to do. So the, the bison, the cattle, the other animals that, that graze will move into the, the burned watersheds. The animals that need um, more shelter will move out. So if you increase the frequency of fire, so you, you burn more often and up to an annual burn, you increase the abundance of those dominant warm season grasses, so big blue stem, little blue stem, uh, switchgrass, Indian grass, the ones that are over here, standing over here in the corner. So those get increased, those are the C4 grasses that Joe mentioned. Um, it decreases woody vegetation, the broadleaf plants, the forbs, and it decreases the cool season grasses like what you plant in your lawn. It also, the more often you burn, the lower number of species you have of plants because you're favoring those dominant grasses. Okay? So you decrease diversity the more often you burn. But you get the, op the same thing if you decrease the frequency of fire. Okay? So you take away fire, you increase woody vegetation, you especially increase cedar. Cedar do very well without fire. Um, and you again decrease plant species diversity. You don't have as many species. Right? So you can end up, and you've probably seen this around town, with just forests of cedar trees. That's all that, that grows there. And that can happen within 50 years, 50 or 60 years. So somewhere in between is what the prairie is, right? So then if we add the grazers on to this, and historically we had large herds of, of bison as the grazers. Um, elk, pronghorn, and deer were more browsers. They ate more of the broadleaf uh, woody kind of plants. And, and so historically we had these large herds of grazers and browsers. Now we mostly have cattle instead of bison. And I'll talk a little bit about comparison of, between those here in a few minutes. Um, but just looking at what grazing does, uh, we added bison to Kanza in 1987. Uh, and you'll learn more about this when you get into the, the whole bison thing. We're somewhere between 250 and 300 animals. They've got about 2,500 acres. They're, they're out there year-round. We don't put them out and take them off. Um, we don't give them supplemental food. They do fine in the winter. They're able to find plenty of food out there in the winter most of the time. 
Uh, the only times we will take them hay is if there's a really bad ice storm or something. Since they're in a fence, they can't go anywhere else. So if there's a bad ice storm so that they can't get down to the grass, we will give them hay. But it's hay that comes from our fire garden mowing, so it's still the na native um, grasses. Where did your herd come from? The original animals came from Fort Riley when they shut down the herd that they had. Um, and then we've traded with other herds um, and swapped animals around to keep genetic diversity up over the years. But, but originally, yeah, it was like 30-some animals that came from Fort Riley. And, and these are like bison of the 150 years ago bison in America? Probably not. Oh. <laughs> Uh, my suspicion is that the bison that survived all the bison slaughter were the ones that were not the big migratory herds. They would have been ones that would have been isolated somewhere and didn't move around very much. And the herds got, I don't even know how, what number they got down to, but I mean it was a big bottleneck. I, I heard 200 in one place and 500 in another. Yeah, yeah, very, very few from the millions that were here. So we lost a lot of the genetic diversity when, when all that slaughter took place. And I think they were they were from Yellowstone area, so they're higher elevation as well. Yeah, that could have been too. And the Yellowstone herd is not very migratory as well either. Uh, they tend to stay around Yellowstone. So I think that that the plains migratory bison no longer exists. Um, I don't know what would happen, to, you know, there's been conversations about opening up the plains and letting the bison roam. I don't know if they would roam now. They might eventually, if we turned them loose and let them go wherever they want to, they might eventually evolve those, those traits back and, and start moving around, but right now I don't know if they would or not. Yeah, but if you had a million bison eating all the grass, they'd have to move. They, yeah, right. they, they would have to move. Um, and, and, you know, they probably move south in the, in the wintertime. Um, there's also, they don't get all the nutrients they need from our grass. Our grass is a little bit protein poor. It's not as uh, protein rich as other places. There's also some other minerals that are lacking here. So we also, we do supply a mineral lick for our bison herd uh, to, to keep them healthy. Uh, something else I was going to say. What that was? I don't oh, cattle genes have also gotten into the bison herds over the, over the years. Our herd has very, 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 very low cattle genes. We've done genetics on them, so we know that. Um, but a lot of the other herds have some cattle genes mixed into them. So we don't really have really pure bison anymore, I don't think. Yes? Do, you, uh, do they actually eat the same material, cows and bison, or do they yes. eat different yes. parts of the plant? No, they, they eat pretty much the same, and I'm, I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute, so hold that thought. <laughs> so, so we maintain our herd to, to remove about 25% of the primary productivity of the plants, and that's sort of an average number for, for wet grasslands, which tall grass is considered a more moist kind of grassland, uh, pretty much around the world, so it's sort of an average number that they came to. Um, the effects of gra grazing we get an increase of non-grass plant species uh, because the bison prefer those grasses that are favored by the fire. Um, and bison, unlike cattle, this is one difference in, in bison and cattle. Um, bison tend to graze areas very heavily and they create these lawns. Uh, so this is a really short area here. And you can see we just burned this and it didn't burn this part. Uh, so. They have this, these lawns that they go back to over and over and over again um, and keep grazed fairly short. If you put burning and grazing together, you come up with sort of this mosaic of habitats. So the prairie was not just one big grassland, or just, just grass, right? It had areas that were burned, areas that were unburned, areas that were grazed heavily, areas that were not grazed as heavily, um, and you had this mosaic of different habitats. Um, different plant species then were in these different habitats. So the more habitats you have, the more plant diversity you have, and the more plant diversity you have, the more animal diversity you have. So animals move around, plants don't move around as easily, but you have different species of plants in different areas depending on how often it's burned and how often it's grazed. Um, bison versus cattle, they both feed on dominant grasses. 
so they eat pretty much the same species of plants. Um, and if you manage them fairly similarly, so, so like our bison herd is out there year-round, the cattle are put on just during the grow, growing season and then taken off. If you manage them similarly, and you have the same sort of quantities of bison and, that, and cattle, and that sort of thing, um, then, then plant-wise, the plant communities are very similar between the two sites. So cattle have pretty much the same effect on the plant community that bison do. The things that bison and cattle do differently, right? so as I mentioned, bison create these intensively grazed lawns. Cattle tend to graze a little more evenly over an area. Bison favor the flat tops of the hills. They don't graze as much on the slopes, except in these really dry years that we've been having recently. They've been eating pretty much everything. Bison create wallows, and, and here's a wallow down here. This particular one has water in it, but most of the year those are dry. And they're up on these other these very dry upland areas. They roll in those, they take dust baths. And that compresses the soil enough that they will hold water when we get the rains. And it creates these little miniature wetlands on these otherwise very dry upland areas. And we get animals that will come and breed in those. We get aquatic plants. There are some of these wallows you can still see outside the bison area that haven't had bison rolling in them in more than 200 years, and they still hold water. They have different plant species. There are these little miniature wetlands, right? And we've got one species of frog. Does your sound work? Yeah. It should. Okay. So there's one species of frog that breeds in these wallows. This little frog, well, I was going to say, did you, do you see it? And I'm pointing to it, so that doesn't help. Um, so there's a little male chorus frog sitting right there. Let's see if I can get it to play. Maybe. Yeah, the, how do you get it? Just push. I did. It's a Mac. <laughs> And how they find these wallows up on this really dry area is beyond me, these little tiny frogs. Uh, it's something I would love to figure out, but I, I don't know how to radio track something that's only two inches long. So I haven't figured that out yet. Um, but they're usually the first frog that comes out in the spring. They, they, if we had rain, they would actually be probably calling this week. But everything's dry, so they're not going to be out yet. Uh, unless they find a little water source somewhere. Uh, bison also horn woody plants. They rub on the trees. I've, I've actually seen some cedars that were sort of isolated out in the bison area when we first introduced the bison, they, and they rub them to death. They love to scratch on things, especially if they're up in the, in the, near the lawns and stuff where they spend most of their time. They, they will rub them to death. Cattle are not as destructive on trees. We also know that, for some reason, the, the cedars that are invasive in unburned areas, in the bison area, you don't see cedars very much at all. So they're doing something to them. And I don't know what. But, but pay attention when you go on your tour, when you pass the 20-year burns in the bison area, they'll have all the other woody vegetation, but they won't have cedars. And then when you compare that to the, the unburned areas outside of the, the bison area that are just loaded with cedar trees. Um, so, so there's something going on there that we don't know what they're doing. And they're also not as constrained by access to water. So, so everybody's probably seen cattle when it's hot out, they're standing under a tree or in a pond or somewhere like that. They're always down near the water and they're in the shade. Bison could care less what the weather is. They're out on the prairie. I've seen them with ice frozen in their beards, standing out on those fields in a day of 20 wind chills. And I've seen them standing out there panting in 100 degrees. So they don't seem to care. And they get most of their water, as we know now, from what they eat and from drinking out of these wallows. So they don't have to come down into the streams and things like that. And you'll, you'll see when, when you drive by Kings Creek, you might see a bison trail go across the creek, but you don't see you know, places where the banks all trampled down and destroyed because the bison just don't spend that much time. Okay, so if we put all these factors together, 
we have these variable weather patterns. And they affect where the plants grow. So if you, if you have a drought year, the tall grasses don't get tall. They stay short. Um, you have a wet year, you get the really tall grasses. If it's too cool, even if you have a wet year, you still don't get the very tall grasses because they need the heat of the summer. So you have this really variable plant growth from year to year, place to place, uh, because of the weather patterns. If we did have the migratory herds of bison, they would be affected by the weather too. If we had a bad ice storm, they would move somewhere else. If uh, it was too wet, floods, that kind of thing, they would move somewhere else. Too hot, they might move somewhere else. Um, so that would have affected these, these ungulate grazing patterns. It also affects where you can have fires travel. So um, if you have a dry, very dry year, you can have fires travel farther from a lightning strike. If you have a very wet year, fires might not go as far. High winds take far, fires farther, lower winds, they don't travel as far, and you get these broader bands of fire. Then you can have interactions between these outer three. So if you have good plant growth somewhere, the bison or cattle, the ungulates would move there to eat that, that plant. Um, if the plant growth is not so good, they move somewhere else. The, the grazing patterns also affect the plants. You actually get sort of increases in plant growth in areas that have been grazed heavily. You get differences in nutrition depending on areas that have been grazed heavily. Um, and actually the bison do better nutritionally wise in drier years, drier years, which most people wouldn't think. But if you have a really wet year and the plants grow really tall and they have a lot of vegetation, all of their nutrients are being spread out amongst all that vegetation. So the bison per bite are not getting as much nutrition. Whereas if it's a drought year, all that stuff is kind of concentrated into a smaller area, and so they can get more nutrition per bite. So they actually do better in drier years. Uh, plant growth also affects fire, the spread of fire. You've got a lot of ve uh, vegetation that can burn. Fires go farther. You don't have as much vegetation. They don't go as far. And bison, I've mentioned several times that bison like burned areas. They, they spend most of their time here in the summer on the burned areas. Um, and when they graze an area very heavily, you can't get fire to go through it. So those grazing lawns within the bison area, even when we burn that area, the fire doesn't travel through that because there's just nothing there. And that's where the bison go when there's a fire. They'll go on to their grazing lawns and they just keep grazing and the fire goes around them. They do not react to fire at all. Um, except for the young, young male gangs, they kind of follow us around sometimes and harass us while we're trying to light the fire. Gangs. Yeah, we call them bachelor herds, but they're almost like teenage gangs of young males. So they kind of band together and run around causing trouble. Um, and then just a few few things, just a few other things. Uh, this is the, I mentioned the new research that we're doing, the patch brown grazing study. Most ranchers in the Flint Hills use something called early intensive stocking, where they burn every single year, all the pasture, they put lots of cattle out there and then they take them off again. Um, and we're finding recently, recent research, we're seeing declines in grassland birds and things like that. Um, and so what, what this ends up doing, we have this early intensive stocking, we have a lot of areas burned every year, graze very heavily, so there's not much vegetation there. And then we have places where people live where they don't burn, don't graze, and you get all these cedar trees. And so it's like we have the two ends of the continuum of the prairie life and there's not as much of the in-betweens. And the in-betweens they're finding is where most of the grassland birds like to nest. So we're losing that kind of habitat. So what the patch burning does is you split a pasture like this one into thirds, and you only burn a third of it each year. But the cattle are able to go wherever they want to. And cattle, like bison, will concentrate on whatever you burn in a, in a given year. So if you burn this area, you have cattle stocked for the whole area, but they'll spend most of their time over here. Next year you burn over here, they go over here, and then there. And so you sort of rotate the grazing and the burning around. Um, these red ones are early intensive stocking controls, and we actually have animal sciences are running the cattle on these sites, and they're, they're taking data on cattle gains and things like that, so they can actually tell the ranchers how much um, this affects the, the cattle gains in weight on their ranches as they take this management practice. 
That's only been going for a couple of years, so we don't have enough data really to say anything yet, but hopefully in another two or three years we'll have some good data out of this. Are the controls burned annually? Yes. Um, we're also monitoring small mammals and bird populations and things like that in those areas to see if that affects the wildlife as well. We have a lot of aquatic research on Kanza. The Kings Creek that you'll probably see when you go on your tour originates entirely on Kanza. So these upper reaches have no agricultural runoff in them. And the, the amount of nitrogen in that creek is very, 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 very low compared to the one that it runs into that does run through agricultural lands. Um, so if you've ever heard the, the people in Illinois saying that they don't, the farms don't dump as much nitrogen into this, any more nitrogen into the stream than the millions of bison did, that's, this is bison. And there's no, no, hardly no nitrogen in that stream, or hardly any nitrogen in that stream. So, because the bison don't stand in the streams like the cattle do. So a lot of research on uh, Kings Creek. We're also now with Shane Creek as part of that patch burn grazing study, we're also looking at how moving cattle around using the burn treatments affects the stream over there. So we're looking at water quality and that kind of thing in, in that particular stream. And then the last two things I will mention, and I'll stop talking, I have no idea how long I've gone. <laughs> This site is a long-term ecological research site. So there's Contemporary Biological Station, which is the physical entity here. And then we have the, the Science Foundation Long-Term Ecological Research Project, which is conducted at CONSA. Uh, sometimes people get those two, think those two things are the same thing, but they're not exactly. And so this was begun, this is a program that began in 1980. Um, they have sites all over the country. They're in Alaska, they're in Hawaii, they're actually they may have them all over the world now. Um, Antarctica. Antarctica. So, so there's a lot of these things. And it's to do research on the ecological processes of these different um, ecosystems that these sites exist in. And so this research is designed site-specific and ecosystem-specific, um, hoping to do some comparisons between them, but also looking at things specific to those research sites. And so Kanza is one of the six initial sites that we've been continuously funded all the way along to 1980. I think we're on LTER 6, 7. We just got funded for 7. We just got funded for 7. Um, and it runs every six years. You can renew that. And then brand new is the NEON, or National Ecological Observatory Network, which is that little tower that's down in the ag field on the way in is part of this. This is another National Science Foundation program. I don't know exactly when it started. They've been talking about it since sometime in the early 90s. Um, but they just recently got the funding, got things going um, in 2011. And this is a site specifically, these are specifically designed to look at changes over time in a particular type of measurements. So every one of these sites is doing exactly the same thing. They're measuring the same things, and then they want to be able to track that over time for, for different ecosystems. There are also several of these in Alaska. There's one in Hawaii and there's one in Puerto Rico. And Kanza is one of the initial sites for this as well. Uh, so we have a lot going on here. Okay, that's it. Questions? <laughs> That's Kanza, Kanza, 40 years of Kanza in a nutshell. And, and keep in mind that we have, I don't know, somewhere around 120 on average projects that go on out here every year. Some of those are the long-term research. Some are just little sign, you know, they come out and collect some, some vegetation for some genetic work. So everything from worms in the ground and bacteria in the ground to flying satellites over and ground truthing satellite images. So, lots and lots of different things and you'll learn about all the equipment here. We've got a seismometer, we've got a sun photometer, we've got all kinds of stuff going on. Out here. Like wrens. We have wrens. <laughs> <laughs> we have snakes. Is that the water, water Northern, snake? Northern, Northern water, water snake. snake. Yeah. Did I hear that 25% of the bison herd is called then every year? 
it, and, it, it, it depends. So like? We 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 call the bison herd to keep them at a particular number. So it depends on how many calves we have in a given year as to how many we'll actually take off. Um, and we actually call more males. So so they're born 50-50. They start out on a 50-50 ratio. And as they each each year they age, we call out more males. Uh, because by the time they get up to seven or eight and they start doing the breeding, they're pretty violent with each other. And we don't want 50% of the herd made up of these guys trying to kill each other. Uh, so, so we get it down to very few by the time they get up old enough to actually start causing damage and breed for the males. Um, but otherwise, we try to, you know, just kind of pick animals that are not doing well or something like that. And I would assume this is it hunters coming in? You're oh, no, no, no. We, we round up the herd, um, and we run them through the corral up by the barn, which you'll probably see, um, which is very interesting because bison are not the same to work as cows. Um, I always tell people that are new to that, if you poke a cow in the butt, it will run from you. You poke a bison in the butt, it will turn around and try to kill you. So we're always up on catwalks up above them with the long poles. Um, our corral is set up like if you've heard of Temple Grandin, uh, mm -hmm. who designed the the more curvature, the curves into the, into it, so that they they're not as constrained and have to turn curves and stuff. And you have to work bison in small groups. You can't work them one at a time very easily. They don't do well one at a time. Um, so so there's there are differences in in trying to work bison. Um, and you'll notice if you go around. And look at the shorter parts of the corral actually have bars on the top. Because another difference, if you open a gate for a cow, it'll run through it. If you open it for a bison, it'll try to find any other way out but the one you gave it. Gave it. So we have to put bars over the top uh, or have them really tall because they'll try to jump out. Uh, so, so they're very, very different to work. But yeah, we run them through that and then we put them out on bid. There are ranchers that will buy them uh, that run bison herds. Okay. Uh, and things like that. We don't we don't do hunting on top. Mm -hmm. How do soil bridges compare in the dry, uh, rocky hillsides compared with the bottomland farmland where most of the agriculture is? That is a very good question. I think I, I don't know for certain because I'm not a soil biologist and I don't know, but I think it's fairly similar, uh, richness wise and nutrient wise and that sort of thing. Maybe a few fewer nutrients up there. You don't get as much moisture on the top as you do down at the bottom. Um, but one of the main reasons it's just not plowed up there is because the soil's not shallow, or is too shallow. But I think nutrient wise, do you know, do you know, John? I don't know, that's a question for Blair. Yeah, you'll have to ask Blair when he comes. He's our, he's our soil biologist, he'll, he'll know that. He'll know that like to the molecules. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there are different soil types up on top and on the bottom too. Um, so I don't, I'm not, not that familiar with that. Sorry, there goes a cedar tree. Burning. Yes, burning the cedar. That was one of the 20 year burns when we burned it for the first time. Cedars are fun to burn. <laughs> <laughs> so, does everyone go out and talk about the burning, or is it? Um, we have a core crew that comes out pretty much all the time on every burn, and then we have volunteers fill out the, the rest of the crew. We usually like to have about 15 people that come out on each crew. Uh, and uh, we, we actually, hopefully, will be burning next week. The weather looks good, the forecast looks good for next week. So if you're interested, you can sign up for burn group. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can certainly do that. All right. Come on, Thank you. Thank you.
demonstrating looking at them. Even as a photographer. So, so it's a talented photographer. Yeah, and since they came out with those little digital cameras that you can stick in your pocket, I drive tractor on the burn crews, so, mm -hmm. so I'm like driving around, holding the camera out the back of the cab, taking pictures. That's Sarah and cousin? Yep. Oh. Yep, we saw one one year, two or three years ago. She came down in the winter. Two years ago? Yeah, I was out with a, with a class. I was showing this class around. And we, we came up on the fence, and there's this monster something sitting on the fence. I'm like, what the heck is it sitting on that fence post down there? He's like, it's a bird. It's a snowy owl. I got really excited. And, and I kept trying to get the guy that was driving the van to, to like really creep up on her really slow so we could get a picture. And his idea of slow was not my idea. So, so she kept flying, flying through the van. That one. Goldfinch. Yeah, Dave Rentow did the bird pictures. I, I'm not a bird person. The rest of them are mine. But he's got all those super zoomy lenses. Who knows what that is? Robert Fly. Robert Fly. Hmm. What is it? Robert Fly. It's a fly, but they're like dragons. They eat bugs on the wing like dragonflies do, so they have more of the body shape of a dragonfly. And that is also Lewis. a fly, not a bee. So it's a bee mimic. It sounds all those little things buzzing around the flowers. Sometimes they're not actually bees. They're they're flies that are bee mimics. It's another big sicil in it. Karen's no, a white crown. Oh, white crown. See, I'm not a bird person. Cat pot. Cat pot's in the briar. That's the last one. White crown. That's probably in the picture. Yeah, she's good. That's sunrise. Beautiful. All right, that's all I have for you today. You have some time to go walk the nature trail. Yeah. Is it gorgeous outside? It is. <laughs>